Hi everyone, in this video lecture, we are going to be talking about the eight hallmarks of cancer. So these are gonna be characteristics that cancer cells have that normal cells don't have. And before we start, I just wanna make a quick distinction about the difference between cancer and a tumor. So when we're thinking about what a tumor is, um, it's gonna be an abnormal growth of cells that forms a massive tissue in the body that's not serving a function. So something like a kidney is also a massive tissue in the body, but it does serve a function. So tumors specifically are cells that aren't, um, aren't doing anything for our bodies. And we can sort of think of two main categories of tumor. Um, and those two categories are benign and malignant tumors. Benign tumors are very localized. They sort of stay in one area and they tend to not spread to the surrounding tissues. Um, so they sometimes need to be removed if they get too large or if they become malignant, which is our second type of tumor. Um, and malignant tumors are tumors that are more aggressive. So they're going to be invading uh, the tissues that are next to the tumor um, and sort of take over um, other yeah, surrounding tissue. And so when we're thinking about what cancer is, um, cancer is a malignant tumor. So tumors and cancer are, are not synonymous, but cancer is more specifically a specific kind of tumor, a malignant tumor that's gonna be invading surrounding tissues. So we're just gonna go through these eight hallmarks of cancer cells um, one by one. So this is just a list of all of the properties that we'll be talking about. Um, so sustained proliferative sig signaling, evasion of growth suppressors, resisting cell death, enabling replicative immortality, inducing angiogenesis, invasion and metastasis, reprogrammed energy metabolism, and last but not least, evasion of immune system. And I just want to reiterate that um, for our purposes, you're not responsible for knowing the name of the specific hallmark, but just the ideas behind um, what that property is. So let's start with sustained proliferative signaling. So this is just the idea that a cancer cell uh, is a cell that's dividing uncontrollably in the sense that it's not reliant on um, signaling molecules to tell it to grow. Our regular cells, on our non-cancerous cells, they do need to divide, right? So cell division in and of itself is not a bad thing. Um, as we're growing, as we're, um, if we get wounded and we need a, a, like a scrape or a cut to heal, all of those things require cell division, um, but normal healthy cells need growth signals in order to divide. They won't just do it um, automatically. So a regular cell will wait until it gets some sort of signal, and here we're showing a signal in this pink molecule, and when the cell receives that signal, because it's got a receptor, then that signal can start a, a sort of cascade of signaling inside of the cell, and the cell might divide in response to a growth signal. The cell is also going to have um, sort of mechanisms to stop that signaling from happening so the cell doesn't divide. Um, so there's a lot of uh, complex um, sort of regulation of this signaling so that cells divide only when they're supposed to. And cancer cells have this sustained proliferative signaling. So this means that they they're not reliant on these growth signals in order to divide. They'll divide whether the growth signals um, are present or not. And so sometimes they'll make the signals themselves. So they'll make their own signals to divide. Sometimes they'll just have these uh, receptors that are supposed to respond to a growth signal. They could just keep these receptors on permanently. Um, so there's different mechanisms that, that cancer cells can do this, but the big idea is that they're, they're not waiting for signals to divide. They're just doing it uh, just by themselves. So I wanna introduce two kinds of uh, gene categories uh, in, this, in this hallmark. So these two gene categories are proto-oncogenes and oncogenes. So proto-oncogenes are normal genes that everyone has. So proto-oncogenes are just um, healthy genes that encourage cell division or what we will call mitosis now that we've gone through that unit. Um, so they're encouraging mitosis when it's appropriate. So if a um, maybe a three-year-old is, is still actively growing, there should be a lot of cell division happening. So these proto-oncogenes are going to be genes that encourage 
um, those cells to divide and for the person to grow. Um, or the, they would also be the same genes that would encourage cell division if you got a cut and you needed that um, wound to heal. However, um, these proto-oncogenes, which are healthy and normal, uh, can become mutated. And when they become mutated, uh, they might stop being responsive to the, the signals that they should be uh, waiting for. So instead of only signaling cell division to happen in response to a cut, maybe these genes are just on all the time, always signaling for the cell to divide. So when these mutations happen and the proto-oncogenes become sort of unregulated, then we call them oncogenes instead. And onco, the prefix onco, um, has to do with cancer. So cancer doctors are called oncologists. So um, these these this name oncogene really is sort of means cancer gene. And proto-oncogene, proto means before. So this is like a before cancer gene. So these are genes that are normal and healthy, they're before they become cancer promoting. So um, these are just two gene categories that have to do with this uh, proliferative signaling and cells dividing when they should, um, sort of because the, the gas is always on for the, for the cell to divide. This next uh, hallmark is similar, but it's coming at it from sort of the opposite angle. So this one is evasion of growth suppressors. And this is the idea that cells normally have a lot of factors that tell them to not divide. So in addition to waiting for signals to say, yes, you should divide, um, cells also have a lot of signals that tell them don't divide. And a lot of these come into play when we think about the cell cycle. So um, when we're thinking about the cell cycle, there's a lot of this, um, what's called interphase. So that's G1, S, and G2. And then there's also this little portion of actual um, active division in mitosis. And in G1 and G2, there are a lot of checkpoints um, where the cell might pause and just sort of take stock of how things are going. So before the S phase where DNA is replicated in G1, there's a checkpoint where the cell checks to see um, if its DNA is damaged because there's no point in replicating the DNA if the DNA has um, mutations or if it's damaged in any way. So the cell will normally check for DNA damage and stop the cell cycle if it detects that damage. Um, but if there's no damage, then the cell will go ahead and copy the DNA. And then in G2, before we go through mitosis, it'll check again to see if whether the DNA was replicated properly. And if either of these checkpoints um, are, are not passed, like if the cell detects damage or improperly replicated DNA, then mitosis won't happen. However, cancer cells are going to ignore these factors that would normally stop uh, cell division if, it de if errors are detected here or here. So it'll keep proliferating even if there's DNA damage or even if the DNA wasn't properly replicated. And we've got one last uh, category of genes to talk about uh, in this context. So these genes are called tumor suppressor genes. And these are genes that are normally supposed to prevent cell division and keep the cell's growth in check. So they might be genes that are involved with this G1 checkpoint to check for DNA damage. They could be genes that are involved with this G2 checkpoint to check whether the DNA was uh, properly replicated. So you could imagine that if a protein um, was supposed to do this DNA replication check, if that got mutated because this tumor suppressor gene wasn't working, then that checkpoint wouldn't be functional. And we'd go through with mitosis even if we had uh, problems with DNA replication. Okay, so one consequence of uh, cancer cells ignoring these growth suppressors is that they often have abnormal karyotypes. And um, perhaps you remember from ninth grade, karyotypes are pictures of a cell's chromosomes. So normal cells are gonna have a very um, neat karyotype with uh, usually two of each chromosome, and these would be a, a homologous pair. Um, so one chromosome from a maternal side and one chromosome from a paternal side. So we'll have two of each and then two sex chromosomes. However, because cancer cells are ignoring these growth checkpoints um, or these uh, growth uh, suppressor checkpoints, um, often they'll have abnormal karyotypes. So they might have extra chromosomes, they might have um, these abnormal chromosomes where they're sort of hybrids with part of one chromosome stuck on to part of another. 
um, missing chromosomes. So often we'll see cancer cells have uh, karyotypes that, that are really messed up looking. Okay, our third uh, hallmark is that cancer cells can often resist cell death. And the process of a cell um, engaging with this sort of self-destruct mode is called apoptosis. So this is programmed cell death, where the cell decides to sort of sacrifice itself if it detects that something is wrong with it. So a normal cell, if it uh, detects that its DNA is damaged beyond repair, or if it's infected with a virus maybe, it will uh, undergo apoptosis and sort of just get sort of shrink up and um, yeah, undergo this, this programmed cell death so that whatever messed it up can't be passed on to its neighboring cells. So it's sort of looking out for the cells that are next to it and hoping that by undergoing this programmed cell death, um, whatever is wrong with it will sort of end with it and um, won't be passed on. So apoptosis, apoptosis programmed cell death. And this slide is showing an example of a situation where normal cells will undergo apoptosis, but cancer cells do not. And this is the idea that uh, normal cells have what's called anchorage dependence. And just like the name suggests, um, almost all normal cells in our body, with the exception of cells that are normally found in the blood, need a solid surface uh, to be anchored on. And without being attached to something solid, uh, they won't be able to grow and divide and they'll actually undergo apoptosis. So normal cells, if you put them in a flask, if you let them settle to the bottom so they can attach to the, to, to the bottom of that um, flask, then they'll grow and divide. But if you keep swirling the flask so that the cells aren't able to attach, then they'll undergo apoptosis. Um, and in contrast, cancer cells, they don't need to be attached to anything. They don't have that anchorage dependence. So even if you're swirling the flask around and not allowing them to settle to the bottom, they'll still be able to grow and divide um, and they won't undergo apoptosis. So cancer cells don't need to be anchored in order to proliferate and they won't undergo apoptosis even if they're not attached to anything. Our next hallmark is uh, enabling replicative immortality. And this has to do with uh, the number of times that a cell can divide before it enters this state of senescence where it's just not really an active cell anymore. It's no longer able to divide. And one of the factors that uh, plays into how many times a cell can divide um, is what's called a telomere. And telomeres are these structures that are on the ends of chromosome arms. So they're shown here in blue. And they get shorter and shorter and shorter every time a cell divides. This has to do with a feature in DNA replication where every time the DNA is replicated, uh, a little bit of the very end of the chromosome gets left off and doesn't make it into the, the replicated copy of the DNA. So every time a cell divides and the DNA is copied, we lose just a little bit of the very end of the chromosome. And so this would obviously be very uh, bad if there was important information on the ends of chromosomes since they're getting sh sort of cut off every time we copy the DNA. So to get around this, these telomere structures are in place and it's just a bunch of bases that aren't coding for anything. There's no genes that are uh, making any important proteins at the end. They're just here as sort of a buffer so that even though the ends of the chromosomes are getting shorter and shorter and shorter, every time the DNA divide or every time the DNA is copied, um, no important information is lost. But eventually the telomeres get short enough that the cell is no longer able to divide without um, cutting into important DNA, maybe like here in red at the border. So telomeres get shorter and shorter every time the DNA is copied, um, which goes along with the number of times that a cell divides. Um, and normal cells, when their telomeres get short enough, um, they just stop dividing. So I think it's like 50 or 60 cell divisions and then the cell won't be able to divide um, anymore. But cancer cells are able to extend their, their telomeres. So they're actually able to make an enzyme that grows the telomeres back out. So they have these extra long telomeres and they're able to, um, in practice, just sort of divide an unlimited number of times. So this is a picture with you where you can see the telomeres in light blue. Um, 
And just a reminder, telomeres are these structures that are the, at the ends of chromosomes, and they act as a sort of buffer to protect the important uh, protein coding DNA in a chromosome. And normally they'll get shorter with each division, but cancer cells are able to extend those telomeres so that they can keep dividing um, and not be limited by shortened telomeres. Okay, so here's another hallmark and it's inducing angiogenesis. And this is just the idea that cancer cells are able to tell the body to provide them with a new blood supply. So uh, it induces, these cancer cells can induce the creation of new blood vessels throughout the body. Um, we talked already about how cells are um, dependent on nutrients coming into the cell and waste being exported. And this is all gonna happen through the blood supply. So oxygen will be delivered through the blood supply, waste will be removed through the blood supply. And so as these uh, masses of cancerous cells are being formed, uh, they require a lot of nutrients and they're producing a lot of waste that needs to be exported. So um, the sort of normal blood supply may not be sufficient for these tumor cells. So they actually signal to the body to, um, induce the creation of new blood vessels. And this uh, provides a really nutrient-rich delivery system um, for the cancer cells. It also, um, it also is, a, is a way that the cancer cells may be able to travel um, to new locations in the body, which is related to this next hallmark, which I'm about to talk about on the next slide. So, this idea of metastasis is when cancer cells are able to spread to a whole new different part of the body and form tumors in that new area. And typically they're going to travel through these blood vessels um, that they may have been causing the body to create or through the lymphatic system. So just to uh, remind us all of where we started. We talked about the difference between a benign tumor, which is a tumor that doesn't uh, invade any surrounding tissue. It stays very localized. And then we contrasted that with a malignant tumor, which is a tumor that's invading surrounding tissue. But if a tumor goes one step further than that, and the cells actually break off and go to a whole new different section of the body, that's what we would call metastatic. So this malignant tumor is invading surrounding tissues, but it's still in the same general area. So maybe in your kidney and it's invading nearby kidney tissue, um, but it's all in the kidney. And then metastatic would be maybe it breaks off and spreads from the kidney to the lungs or something along those lines. So one factor that allows for invasion um, is this idea of contact inhibition. So we talked about anchorage dependence inhibition. So normal cells won't break off from a tissue um, and survive. If they break off and they're unattached, they'll undergo apoptosis. And another thing that prevents normal cells from uh, breaking off and settling in a new area of the body is, is this contact inhibition. So normal cells are very, very sensitive to their neighbors. And if they're touching other cells, uh, they, don't, they don't continue to grow. So normal cells, if you place them in a dish and keep the, the population very sparse, so there's just a few cells, um, they will divide because there's room for, for more cells to grow. Like they're not touching each other, there's, there's space to, to grow. Maybe this is a wound that needs to be healed. So they'll proliferate until the dish is covered by just a single layer of cells that are touching or barely touching each other, but they won't uh, grow over each other. They won't form any sort of lump. Um, they'll just reach a, a single layer of, of cells. So that's what a normal cell will do. And this idea that a cell will stop growing once it's touching a neighbor is called contact inhibition. Cancer cells, in contrast, if you do put them in the same conditions, put them in a dish where there are very few of them, they'll continue to grow just like the normal cells, but they won't stop growing once they're touching a neighbor. And so they'll form um, these sort of lumps or masses where they're growing on top of each other. And um, so they're not displaying this contact inhibition. And one situation where we can see this in nature 
is uh, looking at a, a naked mole rat and naked mole rat skin cells here and lung cells here. So all of this top panel is naked mole rat cells. And on the bottom here, these are all mouse cells. So mouse skin cells and mouse lung cells. And on the left hand side where it's labeled sparse, that's where they're, they've put these cells in a dish and let them sort of settle, but they've kept the number of cells very low so that the cells are uh, very sparse, like there's not a high concentration of the cells in the dish. So because of that, there's room for these cells to grow and the cells are going to divide and proliferate. And they'll keep going until they reach what's called a state of confluence. And saying that cells are confluent has basically mean it means that they've they've reached the point where they're no longer going to grow and proliferate. They're they've reached sort of the critical density, and they're all touching their neighbors enough that contact inhibition is going to prevent them from growing anymore. So if we concentrate on the mouse uh, cells on the bottom, you can say that they become quite um, packed together. So they're not growing on top of each other. These are normal cells, they're not cancerous cells, but they do go right up until they're touching a neighbor and there's quite a lot of cells by the time they reach confluence and it takes about five days. And then if you look at the naked mole rat cells on the top, you can hopefully see that they um, stay quite a bit their, their state of confluence is much sparser than the mouse uh, cells. So even though they're, they're touching each other, they're just barely touching and there's still a lot of space in between the cells. So they have a really um, early contact inhibition. They stop growing even when there's, there's just barely, barely touching each other. Um, and it takes much longer for them to reach this state, about 10 days to go from here to here. So um, people think that this is one of the reasons why uh, cancers are virtually never found in naked mole rats, uh, is this aggressive early contact inhibition. And here's a, a bonus picture of a naked mole rat, just for fun. <laughs> okay, so we're on our last couple uh, hallmarks, and this one is about reprogrammed energy metabolism. So this one is about the ways in which cancer cells, um, compared to normal cells, will uh, utilize fuel. Um, so normal cells are going to primarily rely on cellular respiration. And this is where um, cellular respiration is where we use um, oxygen to break down sugar and we get a lot of ATP. So it's a very efficient means of, of getting energy for a cell. And then for normal cells, if there happens to be not enough oxygen available, so maybe if you're exercising really hard, then a secondary metabolism pathway is this anaerobic respiration. And this is when you don't use oxygen, but it's a lot less efficient. You get much less ATP through this process. Um, so normal cells will primarily uh, rely on cellular respiration, but if there's no, not enough oxygen present, then they can switch to anaerobic respiration. Uh, cancer cells are going to primarily rely on anaerobic respiration, even if there's oxygen present. So they're utilizing this less efficient um, way to get ATP for their cells. And because it's less efficient, they also uh, have a much faster metabolism. So they cycle through glucose at a much quicker rate than regular cells are going to do. So here's a, a picture just sort of showing that visually. On the left, we're showing a normal cell and the size of the arrow is showing sort of the way the pathway will normally go. So if there's oxygen present, we'll take glucose and we'll go through uh, cellular respiration in the mitochondria and we'll make a lot of ATP through that pathway. But if we don't have glucose, uh, I mean, sorry, if we don't have oxygen, then we'll take glucose through this anaerobic pathway and we'll make lactate and pyruvate and um, some other byproducts and we'll make just a little bit of ATP. So less efficient, but it has the benefit that it's more flexible since you can do it without oxygen. And here's uh, this picture on the right is showing what cancer cells will do. Um, and you'll see that with or without oxygen, it doesn't matter, they're still going to go through this anaerobic pathway. So instead of going to the mitochondria and making a lot of ATP through cellular respiration, they're going through this anaerobic pathway where they're making lact lactate and these other byproducts and making just a little bit of ATP. And the prevailing hypothesis about why cancer cells do this, since it seems 
not beneficial for them to go through this uh, inefficient method of making ATP, um, people think that these byproducts that anaerobic respiration produces um, are really helpful for the cancer cells because they can be used as building blocks so um, for, for new cell materials. So since cancer cells are dividing so quickly and dividing more than normal cells, um, these byproducts of anaerobic pathway are helpful for them because they are um, useful when you're making a new cell. They're, they're building blocks for making new cells more efficiently. So that's one idea about why cancer cells go through this anaerobic process, even though it doesn't make as much ATP as aerobic cellular respiration. Okay. And this is our final property um, or final hallmark, and it's evasion of the immune system. So this one is about a cancer cell's ability to evade destruction by the body's immune system. And we're showing three uh, sort of steps here whereby this property can um, sort of come into play. So uh, our, our immune system does in fact recognize a lot of uh, precancerous or cancerous cells and will take care of them. So there are some immune cells in our bodies whose whole job is to sort of roam around and look for cells that seem suspicious and it will kill those cells so that they don't become a problem. So our immune system cells like uh, killer T cells and natural killer cells are going to be removing um, cancerous cells. However, um, they're not perfect. So there may be some cancer cells that evade um, elimination from these from these immune system cells. So then we'll sort of enter into this stage of equilibrium. And in this equilibrium stage, the cancer cells can't divide uncontrollably. They can't sort of make their presence too obvious because then our immune system cells will still be able to um, attack and kill them. So if the cancer cell shows itself too much, um, we, we made an analogy in class of sort of hide and seek, like if it makes itself too obvious, then the immune system will see it and kill it. But in the meantime, uh, if the cancer cell sort of stays low key and sort of hidden, then the immune system may not be able to find and discover all of the tumor cells. So it's sort of a waiting game. And in this equilibrium phase, uh, the tumor cells may be able to get some mutations that allow it to sort of hide better from the immune system cells. The tumor cells can um, get some adaptations that will allow them to be unrecognizable. And at that point, we've reached this escape phase and the um, tumor cells are gonna be able to divide much, much, much more rapidly. However, um, because they have these adaptations, the immune system won't be able to do anything about it. So. At that point, um, the cancer cells are able to evade destruction by the body's immune system because they have these adaptations to avoid recognition. So that's our last property or hallmark of cancer. Um, and I will talk to you all soon.